My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today I'm speaking with Daniel C. Daniel is the co-founder of Space Makers, a productivity consulting group for busy leaders. His book, Space Maker, How to Unplug, Unwind, and Think Clearly in the Digital Age, won the Australian Business Book Award in 2021 for personal development and was a finalist for Best Technology Book and Best Cover Design. As a trainer, coach, and keynote speaker, Daniel has worked with CEOs, executives, and other senior professionals throughout Australia and beyond. He is the creator of best-selling productivity courses such as Email Ninja, List Assassin, Priority Samurai, and Space Maker, uh, with more than 20,000 students online and offline. Daniel has a broad professional history, which includes leadership roles in physiotherapy, health management, project management, and Christian ministry. He lives in Tasmania, Australia with his wife and children. Um, and I'm just really thrilled. You know, we had uh, some scheduling conflicts, but we are finally recording the interview. So thank you so much, Daniel, for, for uh, dialing in and, and recording this with me. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Dave. We made it, didn't we? Which is great. <laughs> so yeah, it's what, 8, 8 a.m. Uh, there right now? Yeah, so I'm the day after you, so I can let you know it's, it's going to be a good day when you finally get there. Uh, <laughs> it's the way it works in Australia. Yeah, uh, cool. Well, um, let's, uh, let's start off with where it all began. Where were you born and raised? Uh, what was your, your family life like growing up? And, and really take me on a journey. You know, what are some of the major influences in your life that, that shaped who you are today? Yeah. So look, I'm from a place called Adelaide, which is uh, a pretty small, but dry city. Uh, if you look at it in summer, everything's, everything's brown. It's quite different than the, the green you see in Europe and parts of America. Uh, so I'm half Chinese. So my dad's from Hong Kong originally, and he ended up coming to Australia when he was about 17. Uh, and my mum is you know, a dinky die Aussie. So uh, I don't know what you call it, just, just an Australian. And, uh, and so like I grew up with this kind of multicultural background on the one hand, we'd go camping and, you know, go bushwalking and explore the outdoors because that's what my mum enjoyed. And when it came to my dad, he was a gambler. We went to, you know, the races uh, and then we went to Mahjong and which is like a, a gambling card game. We spent our Sundays in the Mahjong club and then we'd go out to eat yum cha. So it had this kind of different experience from some kids around me, particularly in those days in the seventies, there wasn't a lot of blended marriages in the way that we have them now. Uh, so that probably shaped me a little bit. What was the name of the, the town that you grew up in? Adelaide, Adelaide, South Australia, South, yeah. South Australia. Is there any like major city close by that would be a, a good reference for people? Uh, probably Melbourne would be the biggest one. People know Melbourne and Sydney, obviously, and Adelaide's further to the west between Perth and Melbourne. This arid, uh, you know, dry <laughs> town that you grew up in, um, you know, you, you said that you grew up in this multicultural um, setting that, you know, clearly it, it, it had to have had uh, some benefits and, and just really allowing you to experience the best of both worlds and, 
and probably some of the the stuff that isn't so good. Um, I, I don't know what that would be. Uh, I just would imagine because there's always uh, there's always tough stuff uh, when when you're different from everybody else, you know. So, uh, like, did any of those experiences um, affect you positively or negatively? Yeah, look, I I was a bit different, you know, from the kids around me. There weren't many. Well, there wasn't there weren't many kids who came from different countries full stop. And so I certainly got picked on sometimes for looking different and having black hair and, and uh, my, my language and my accent is the same as everyone else, but just culturally there were some differences. Uh, it's, it's really hard when you're an adult to look back and find out what actually shaped you. But I certainly see the world through the, I have the ability to see culture fairly well and to recognize what are the things about our culture that are particular or different. Uh, you, you know, the expression, you know, that we are humans are like fish in water and it's very hard to describe the culture that you're soaked in. But I think when you come from a multicultural lens, well, you can kind of look at the way people live and then you look at the way that the other kind of people live and you start to put words to those kind of things. And I think that's helped me to, uh, you know, for example, with the writing and speaking that I do, it's helped me to look at our digital culture and our, our culture where we're very individualized and where we don't uh, you know, we don't really have a communal culture in the West and to be able to give some language to that in a way that can help people. So I think, I think that's been useful. What, what led you on this path to be a speaker and a writer? I mean, like, I, I'm curious, where, did you always have this passion for speaking or, or writing? Yeah, not necessarily. So I was originally a physiotherapist. I think you call them physical therapists in the States. And I did that for more than a decade. Uh, and it, it never really fit, actually. Like I was, I worked hard. And so I, I, I did fine in the profession. But I just, I don't know, it, it was almost like I was always wearing my shoes on the wrong feet. And I always knew it. And then I inadvertently ended up in management. And I realized how much I enjoyed leading people and speaking and doing the kind of leadership type stuff, uh, changing culture uh, and, and setting direction. And I really started to enjoy reading about productivity and how to not just get stuff done, but how to manage yourself, which really led to this passion and love of, I suppose you'd call it self-development. I, I, I don't even know if I knew the word back then, but it's, it was really about how do you shape your time? How do you shape your values about your, around your why uh, and make sure you live an intentional life? And, you know, so through a number of different iterations, I ended up starting my own productivity training and coaching business. Uh, and, and really, like I'm in my mid 40s nowadays, and I think it's quite common to, you know, in around, you know, in about the 40s, 50s for people to really start to distill what they're good at. You know, I, I say that um, in the 20s and 30s, it's like you want to try as many things as possible and find out what kind of jigsaw puzzles fit your life and then in your 40s 50s 60s you kind of want to put it together and get rid of all the stuff that doesn't really fit and so I feel like I'm in this pruning process where I know that I love to I love to train so, so I love to speak I love to write and I love to start new things and uh, and obviously start things that really help society so, so that's where I'm at at the moment but it's taken me probably 20 something years of of work in order to distill that down to the, the things I really love and the, to understand how I'm wired. Now you do a, a lot of speaking engagements. What do organizations bring you on uh, to talk about mostly? I, I'm guessing that it's productivity, but is there a, a common theme uh, beyond or maybe that is more narrow than just productivity? Yeah, so it's more narrow and it's a bit broader at the same time. So my passion is to help people make space in the whirlwind of life. Uh, so space, not in their physical lives necessarily, but in their mental and work lives. So space to think deeply, space to rest fully, space to reconnect with people they love face to face in real ways. Um, and maybe just <clears throat> space to think and plan and be intentional in the way they live. So everything I speak about is that kind of space maker concept. And really, particularly post COVID, I, I don't think people need more information. I mean, we're just soaked in new ideas. 
And I, I think many of the clients I work with, they don't need more opportunities and they, a lot of them don't really need more money. Uh, what, what they long for is more space. They, they long for more time to live without feeling rushed, to, to be present with their kids and not feel like they have to check their inbox, uh, to be able to go bushwalking or, or exercise and just do it because they enjoy it, you know, and, and, and do something creative like playing music or, or doing a board game and, and not feel like they're, they're missing out on all the things that they have to be doing at the same time. So, uh, yeah, so, so I speak about helping people make space and there are lots of ways to do that, obviously whether it be getting your inbox to zero or turning off your technology in order to live well. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you've uh, come <clears throat> up with uh, any particular formula that, um, you know, is easy to adapt, you know, regardless of your position uh, in an organization or in uh, the community. Mm, absolutely. So in, look, in my book, I talk about an, uh, an upside down U curve. If you look at biology, like almost everything is an upside down curve in the sense of you have this kind of growth, you know, let's say there's a, there's a predator, okay, it enters an environment and it starts to thrive, but eventually it eats all its prey and there's no food left. And so the predators start to reduce and, and the prey increases again. So you get this kind of natural curve, you see it uh, in viruses, you see it everywhere and you see it in in education um, and and actually what I see it in is productivity as well. And so if you mapped out technology against productivity, uh, imagine a graph and then you draw an upside down U. Okay, so you need to use technology really well to be productive. And clearly when you get an iPad, an iPhone, you get some apps and you learn some tech skills, your productivity goes up because the power of technology allows you to expand your reach and broaden your knowledge and influence but then there comes this plateau which is like the productive middle where more technology doesn't make you more productive and then you slide down the right hand side of the curve into digital overuse and that's where you become less happy less healthy and less productive by using more technology so that's what happens when you reach for your phone first thing in the morning and last thing at night when you are you know, checking your phone on the toilet when you, when you can't be present with your kids because you're thinking about how many hearts you have on Instagram, you know, or where you just use up so much of your life scrolling through some infinity program that you, you can't broaden the experiences of your life and do the things that really matter. And so in terms of the framework you asked about, I help people and organizations on both sides of that upside down curve. So on the left side, I teach people to get their inbox to zero every day. So email ninja. Uh, how to run online to-do lists, how to prioritize, how to run meetings that don't suck, you know, all those kind of core skills, which I call keeping pace. And then the habits of making space are on the right-hand side, which are the ones we have to unplug and unwind to rest intentionally, to build intentional relationships disconnected uh, in order to actually be healthy and productive. And we need to be working on both skill sets at the same time concurrently in order to be our best selves. In this, uh, you mentioned email ninja. Um, th is that a, a course? Is it an app, uh, a program, or what is that? Yeah, look, it's the name of a training course. I had too many whiskeys one night with a mate, and we came up with email <laughs> ninja. And then, uh, and that's where my business started. I basically put together a simple format to help people from a habit perspective, improve high volume email. Uh, so the research says like a 10% improvement in email efficiency will buy back the average knowledge worker. So that would be you and I, people who use our brains for a living, as in that's the job is to communicate. Uh, we'd buy back two work weeks per year if you just improve your email efficiency because of how much you get slammed on email. And so we help people to create, like to set up different folders and to create particular habits and use the current outlook tools in a way that reduces the distraction uh, and the key aim of email ninja is to stop you letting email determine what you do each day to turn off that second screen and to be proactive in determining your priorities rather than letting yourself kind of just react your way through the day which is so common particularly in government organizations and industry uh, and yeah so it's it's just a name but then you know 
because we had Emo Ninja, well, then we decided to stick with the Ninja theme and we went with List Assassin and Priority Samurai, but they're just training <laughs> courses. The Space Maker program, did that start off as a, a course or did you write the book first? I wrote the book first. Uh, I so the book took me seven years to write. Uh, it was kind of a hidden project, and I never wanted to tell anyone about it because I never thought I'd actually publish this thing. You know, so <laughs> I didn't want to increase the pressure on myself. Uh, but I rewrote the book so many times, and it it just grew actually as my understanding of digital overuse grew. It it just began because I've. I've had this habit for a long time of turning off technology once a week. So on a Saturday, uh, I now call it a digital Sabbath. I didn't have any term for it back then. And I wrote a blog post and a number of news agencies and like media outlets picked it up and said, Hey, this is really interesting. A guy who deliberately turns off his phone, how radical, you know, and this is like this is seven, eight years ago now. So people weren't talking about Facebook and Instagram addiction and all the kind of things we're talking about now. And that got me thinking that there was something in this space. And I just, I had this gut feel that technology overuse was going to become a global problem, not just something I was feeling and kind of as a bit of a niggle. And obviously over the next six, seven years, it's gone from being a niggle to a full-blown epidemic. Uh, and, uh, and now I don't have to convince people that they spend too much time on their phones. Everyone knows it. They just don't know what to do about it. Uh, and so the book took seven years because I just kept reading research and asking more conversations and going deeper and deeper and deeper into what I was seeing. Uh, and new books came out like Cal Newport's kind of digital minimalism and a whole lot of other books. And I'm, every, every new book, I'm like, oh, have I missed my chance? But they hadn't looked at it quite the way I had. And, and I think the journey had allowed me to, to look at it quite deeply. So, yeah, I don't know how that doesn't answer your question, but the, the course is very new. It, it's simply a way of helping people in a short period of time look at what's in the book in a, in a fast and quick way. You mentioned turning off your phone. So, is that part of the program is that you, you schedule time that you just kind of unplug? Yes. I mean, I don't, oh, I, I don't know if I would have a program when it comes to, you know, the space maker habits, it's more of a paradigm shift, which leads to some practice shifts. Uh, so my conclusion, so, so originally I went to write a 20 page ebook, which is how do you turn off your phone on a, like a day off so you can have deep rest how might you not use your phone for all meetings and for exercise? And, uh, you know, how might you start and end the day without technology by not reaching for your phone as an alarm clock? Some really practical kind of life hacks. But I soon realized that it, it just doesn't work unless something changes in your head. Because we live in a story, and this is maybe where it relates to my childhood, you know, and understanding culture. Uh, we live in a story. And uh, the Western story is wrapped up with technology, with the idea that unlimited freedom makes you happy and we need to express ourselves without limitations. Uh, all those stories add up and make it really hard for us to turn off our phones, even beyond the addictive design of Instagram. And so what I've realized, unless we can change our paradigm, our story, and our understanding about what technology is and how we use it and why we use it. If we don't have that self-examination, just I can't tell you to turn off your phone for a day a week because it's not going to work. Uh, you've got to have an inner conviction, a bit like giving up smoking. You've got to really believe that you need to do it in order to simply not put the cigarettes in your mouth. Uh, and and at the so, so uh, I take people on a journey of understanding their story, recognizing that behavior is at the end of the, is at the end of the assembly line of your beliefs uh, and then once you change your story then how might you develop better principles that work across work and life and then the last bit is the question you answered you asked me you know what's the program what are the practices they're pretty simple yeah hmm. does that make sense yeah um I'm, I'm curious as to how you help people with that paradigm shift like what mm. are what are some of the processes that you walk your clients through to to help them achieve that yeah so again it's always knowledge and information 
I, I suppose I, I help people question the stories that they have. So let me give you some examples. Well, firstly, I look at it from a neuroscience perspective because that's my physiotherapy background. I help people recognize what they're doing when they use the internet so much. So I give a story, for example, about when I used to play the piano and I was, you know, I was horrible at the piano. I played for like, I had to practice 15 minutes a day. And I remember fighting with my parents constantly just to do my 15 minutes of practice. But eventually after many years of my parents forcing me to play the piano, uh, I could play Chopin and Mozart without sheet music. And my fingers just moved because that practice built up synapses in my brain. It's called neuroplasticity. My brain grew in the music centers. Uh, and I eventually, you know, could automatically play particular songs because the connections had been made. Uh, but, I, but the same thing happens with whatever we habitually practice and the average American knowledge worker is practicing the internet 12 hours a day nowadays. Uh, the average American, like I suppose worker is I think nine hours a day. Young people are more than older people, but uh, we're actually practicing the internet. And like, I think, imagine if we practice the piano 12 hours a day, <laughs> I mean, like the, the music centers of your brain would just be tremendously strong, but what else would happen is you probably wouldn't be very physically fit and you probably wouldn't do a lot of other things because you don't have time because you only have a certain amount of time in the day. And it's exactly what's happening with our brain uh, that we are reducing the neurodiversity of our brain. We're expanding areas of our brain related to multitasking, dis distracted thought, uh, it's leading to more anxiety and worry and the inability to focus and be still. Uh, we're losing gray matter in our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain which relates to emotional control and patience and, and uh, the ability to differentiate important from non-important information. Uh, so so while, while this is neuroscience, it's also a story. And the story is uh, there's nothing wrong with the internet, but you probably want to be careful with only practicing one instrument and not allowing it to practice, not allowing yourself to practice other instruments and to broaden and create a healthy brain. Uh, and that's just one of the many paradigms I go through to help people recognize that I'm not saying don't use the internet. I, I mean, I, I love digital technology. You and I are talking right now from the other side of the world and my yeah. business is almost completely digital, but I am saying that unless we intentionally disconnect from our devices in this hyper digital age, we may never be unplugged. Our brains may never experience what it looks like to sit and look at a tree or to sit by the ocean and not pull out our phones, smell the fresh air and just relish in the simplicity of life. And if we lose those experiences, if we lose face-to-face -face connection, if we lose the ability to be in silence and contemplate, on our lives, if we if we lose the ability to rest our minds away from a screen, uh, we become less than human, and and the impacts affect everything. So there's there's this natural curiosity that I have about how people end up having this passion to the point where they become an expert in whatever they're passionate about. Um, how does that passion develop? And I, I'm curious, at what point did you make this shift where you're, you know, you're a physical therapist, you go into management, what was the need that was driving this, this mindset that you've got to make things more productive or I need more time? Was it that you were building, you know, your family and you wanted more time with your family? Like, can you talk me through uh, how you develop this passion? That's a good question. Uh, there's a guy called Richard Bach who says, I teach best what I most need to learn. And if I'm really honest, I've been wrestling with space my whole life. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, even before I started a business, I was someone who started stuff. I love work. I love starting things and changing things and trying to disrupt people's way of seeing things. Uh, but that comes with taking on too many projects and overextending myself and not finding it easy to slow down myself. So I think at that probably bigger picture level, uh, 
I've always wrestled with the drift towards overwork and overcommitment. And I nearly burnt out in my thirties. That's a different story, but I wrote that in my book. Uh, and yet at the same time, I'm also a really spiritual person. Uh, I, I became a follower of Jesus when I was young. I've always been someone who, well, since then I've been someone who prays and who practices contemplation and silence. Uh, and I'm, I'm really committed to community. I actually bought land and share land with another couple and I've, I've um, created a life without fences, uh, a life where uh, we kind of co-parent almost as families and where we invite our neighbors in uh, and we have a weekly meal. We've done that for more than a decade. So I have these kind of values of spirituality, which are kind of community and contemplation. And at the same time, this passion for work and changing the world. And I think they probably just somehow combined where I realized that actually digital technology was uh, as wonderful as it is is probably one of the key issues of our day that is shaping the future of humanity. I would, I would say it that strongly. And, uh, and some of the things we're losing are the ability to be spiritual people, to examine the inner life, to, to, to really have deep relationships and to know ourself from the inside out. Uh, and probably it's a prophetic message that came out of those combined passion. When we identify what's important to us, that's when you can have that paradigm shift that you're talking about. Is it, would you say that aligns with what you've found? Yeah, I definitely think we're singing from the same song sheet. Uh, I use the term making space because in my mind, you can't know yourself and live your script rather than the script of what everyone around you tells you. You know, you can't know your life calling or to reflect on who you'd like to be when you're 80 years old or even uh, even reflect and understand and make sense of the emotions and experiences of your day-to-day -day life that then lead to you to detect your life's calling as Viktor Frankl said uh, you, you can't do that unless you make space to think it, it just won't happen accidentally it requires work and disruption like you just you mentioned and the ability to feel like, who am I and what is my identity and why do I exist outside of my role or my achievements uh, or my relationships? And, uh, but in order to do that nowadays, it's not as easy as it used to. And it was never easy because we have this amazing little $2,000 supercomputer in our pocket that whenever we feel those pangs of discomfort, we can just play Candy Crush or find out what others are thinking about us on Instagram. Does that make sense? And so uh, if, if you don't make space by intentionally shifting your digital habits, you may never have the space to examine the inner life and to reflect on your calling. And therefore, you may turn around when you're 80 and realize that you'd spent your whole life looking at other people's photos and you never lived your own. And uh, so, so I'm passionate about the same thing as you are, helping people discover their why, which is what I think productivity is about. It's, it's not about being efficient. It's about knowing who you are and living intentionally in that space. Uh, and the other thing I suppose I'd say to add to that is I don't think there's one calling. I've, I've had enough life now to realize that at least in my life, there have been periods of set and reset, which I do talk about in the book, but uh, there are times where you know you're in the right place, the right relationship. You feel like you're walking in your calling and, and that was probably when you're in the fire department to start with. And then it wasn't, you know, uh, but then a disruption happens, you know, the world goes into a pandemic and there's a great resignation, you know what I mean? <laughs> or there's a divorce or a death. Uh, and, and you start to recalibrate for the next season. What does it mean to be, you know, Dave or Daniel or whoever? Uh, and that can change, but the key is to continue being willing to reflect on that space. Uh, You'll find that people that are, are high achievers tend to, find the same kind of literature. They, they find the, the same kind of meaning to life. Uh, doing different occupations, but I think that's that realization that takes time to come to. You know, like you said earlier, uh, it's like 40s, 50s. I, I'm 48. Um, you know, Took a while, uh, but when you 
when you come to that point where you realize that life isn't all about you, you know, and, and what we do when we know what our purpose is, what really, what our values are, what's important to us, we can find the, the reality that is what we do in any given season is just the expression of what's important to us. If we're being true to ourselves, because I don't know about you, but I've done a lot of jobs that I hated. I was miserable in, and I really didn't, uh, you know, feel like I was expressing my values in those, uh, you know, I was a roofer, I, you know, did concrete work. I did a lot of manual labor stuff uh, that I did not like doing. <laughs> Look, I think all those experiences typically, if you allow them to, you know, build character, you, you take the gold with you. You know, someone once said, if you're in a pit, make sure you don't leave without the gold. Uh, I think, I think uh, Bruna, who was on your podcast recently said, you know, your poison becomes your medicine. And I'm not yeah. sure being a laborer is quite poison, but it's the same idea that if like all the experiences with my physiotherapy, you know, I, I'm not naturally an empathetic person. If you look at my Clifton or Gallup kind of strength finder top 34 themes you know i'm strong on strategic and some of those kind of focused task oriented things and then like empathy is all the way down <laughs> right at the bottom uh, so i needed 10 years of caring for sick elderly people to actually have compassion for those who weren't like me and to grow in the character and persistence of learning how to be uncomfortable and persist and and to learn to communicate with people who have different worldviews, like all of that comes forward into who I am at the moment, even though the profession looks different, even the habit chain stuff. Uh, Ema Ninja is a habit-based course. My book is a habit-based book. And physiotherapy is about teaching people to change their physical habits. And I just translated that into productivity. And so the reality is you take it all with you. And every experience is meaningful if you allow it to be, like you said, uh, reflect on what it means, do your best, be honest and integrous. You know, there's an expression, I think my church pastor once said, you know, it's faithfulness to today's responsibilities brings new opportunity. And I think it's true. I want to thank you for, for spending this time with me and sharing some of your wisdom with the audience. Uh, for those listening that would like to connect with you or learn more about you, get your book, what, um, where would you like to send people? Hmm. Uh, so I have a website, spacemakers.com.au. AU is for Australia and all my stuff's there. Uh, I normally send people to a landing page, but actually given our conversation, there is a blog post that I wrote this year called uh, about, about what what I learned on the second mountain, which is actually the, the process of yeah, what I learned through grief and struggle and the process of finding my calling actually might be worth reading if people found the second part of this conversation useful. It's on my blog post. Feel free to have a read. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned something. I, I feel like maybe you were elusive earlier. Like I, I didn't get the sense that there was this rough patch in your life that led to this growth. Get, do you feel comfortable enough talking about it? Oh, sure. I mean, I've had lots of rough patches in my life. I, I, uh, but the second mountain blog post was about my last iteration. So I feel like I'm in a period of reset right now. Uh, you know how I mentioned I bought land and live in community with another family. Well, after living, you know, like, like family, closer than family for 13 years, uh, Michael, the, my neighbor next door had a heart attack in August last year. And, you know, I tried to resus him, but he didn't survive. And so, uh, so I'm living in a block where I'm the only adult male now. And, and that's led to a big reset in my life. But again, you know, you poison becomes medicine uh there's lots of grief in that space but it's also compelled me 
to change a lot of things. There was a, there was a job that I was in for a decade, uh, half time. And I felt very responsible for the people I led, but I kind of came to the conclusion recently that actually we're all going to die one day. And it, there's, there's a time where I have to leave that job, whether I want to <laughs> or not. And why not leave it 20 years earlier than I thought I would, you know, so that compelled me to make another life change, which has led me to being on the speaker circuit and writing another book and a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, so that's not, a, that's not a very deep explanation, but yeah, I'm in a process at the moment of reassessing who I want to be, uh, what matters most in a season of grief rather than a season of productivity. And how do I both shrink my world to care for those who are closest to me, uh, practically, you know, chop more wood and care for the land that we used to share. Uh, but at the same time, you know, how do I broaden my reach and share my story where it's helpful? I've actually had quite a few people on and I've been on some other uh, podcasts where the, the topic, the main topic is, is grief and loss. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we feel as though nobody could understand what we're going through, but the reality is, is that so many people experience loss and maybe some people aren't that good at uh, being empathetic or you know, maybe they're not so skilled at expressing um, you know that connection but and, and that can be difficult so it, it is uh, you know from my experience when I when I lost my my brother and I lost my mother, my grandfather, all in a short period of time. Um, there was always those people that would say things that um, can be pretty frustrating, you know? Uh, and I haven't always been the most patient person so I've, uh, those are some things that I've been working on. Um, the, the lessons learned, you know, through the grief and loss is, I think, huge. Um, if for no other reason that when somebody close to you experiences something similar, you can be there, put your hand on their shoulder and tell them that it's not always going to hurt so bad. And look, I think it relates to what we talked about before. Every experience of life can shape who you are and guide you to where you're meant to be next. It just sucks when it's painful. <laughs> but honestly, that's where most of us grow the most. And so it's, and it's part of life. Uh, and it's helped me to make some space again to, to think about it. So, hmm. well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I'm sorry for your loss. Hmm. Uh, I, I can only imagine. Um, well, How to finish on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> well, Can people learn what is on the horizon for you uh, by going to your website? Because you said that you're in the process of writing another book. Um, is there a, a new program that you're developing? What's, what's the latest passion for Daniel? Yeah, so the latest passion is still around speaking about space, but particularly around technology. Uh, my new book is a little different in the sense that uh, one of the key questions that always comes up when I speak, when I talk about technology for adults and leaders is what about my kids, which I completely understand as a parent. And so my next book is, I'm thinking of calling it raising humans, you know, instead of cyborgs and uh, <laughs> a very practical, you know, book about 
setting your kids up with good tech habits when they're young. There's a lot of books in that space, but I'm going to make it really short so that parents can read it in an hour and just get the best of what I know. Uh, I don't know where that will lead. Again, I don't, I should be more strategic. I tend to just write from a place of passion and see if I can monetize it later on. But (laughs) if it helps, it helps. Uh, But obviously I I do run courses and I run them online. So if people are interested in some of my productivity stuff or my anti-productivity stuff, uh, we also have a trainer in in Canada who can speak to the American time zone. So I don't have to get up at two in the morning if we can't negotiate a time. So anyway, sign up to my blog, uh, have a look at some of my stuff. And if ever you want a conversation, reach out, I'm on Zoom. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. And again, uh, for those of you that want to learn more about Daniel, spacemakers.com.au. And I'll have a a link in the show notes for that. And the blog, is that on spacemakers.com as well? Yeah, I'll send you a link to that post as well. All right. I will have that in the show notes. So thank you once again. Thank you so much, man. Great to have you. Uh, Great to have this conversation. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.